like, you are, you are the future because you're, you know, unemployed. Right? I'm in between jobs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this, this panel is about how Bill and, uh, and, and Chris killed off tips and tricks. And uh, it's also about <laughs> representing. And actually, um, I don't know how many of you guys know. Okay, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm also supposed to be moderating and introducing here, so excuse me. Uh, I'm Chris Kohler. I do the, the games blog for, for Wired Magazine. Um, over over here is uh, Bill Kumpel, who is one of the first video game journalists, one of the founding editors of Electronic Games, and more importantly, uh, as far as things you can buy here at the show, author of Confessions of the Game Doctor, a uh, book that does not stand on its own power, <laughs> <laughs> but is otherwise excellent, and you can purchase it from uh, from Len Herman's uh, Relenta Press booth in the main expo center. Yeah. Good spring for hardcover vigilant. Uh, Chris Beniak up until recently was the editor of Gifts and Tricks magazine. Uh, it's still a, a fine, oh, it's been still is the Gifts and Tricks. Yeah. Uh, and your chief again. Did you know that? Dan here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a little turf war, I think, going on there. Yeah. Which you can, you can talk about. Oh, exactly. That was just a title. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not going to stand here, but I'll show us. Share a microphone like Paul and George. We're going to be fighting over this microphone. I'm basically here to just say, that's right, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bill, I think you had an idea for what we could talk about. Well, it, it struck me as interesting that, you know, uh, well, you know, Chris had kept this magazine alive and profitable for 13 years, and it only took me nine months to destroy it. I mean, Dracula doesn't have a better touch than that. But I don't think he can probably really be, be laid entirely on my shoulders. Uh, and I think the real issue is, is there a place in this world today for print journalism in terms of game magazine coverage? I mean, the you know, EGM, you may have noticed, has stopped putting in the blow-in subscription cards, okay? That's called death by attrition. You know, Ziff Davis would love to sell off the package, but nobody wants to buy the magazine in. Game Informer has basically adopted the old 1950s Life Magazine paradigm of you stop people in the street and at gunpoint force them to take a free subscription to your magazine, and then you can say, well, we've got a million subscribers! Uh, but you have to wonder how long advertisers will even bother continuing to produce print ads for one magazine. Yeah, wait, it's, it's, it's crazy because it doesn't, um, it, it just doesn't work out for them anymore. The numbers have to go and actually look at an issue of EGM now and count up the number of pages that are devoted to ads from video game companies advertising video games. It's really very, very small. They're not buying the back cover anymore. You know, you see stuff from the U.S. Army and uh, tag body spread. You don't actually see video game companies bursting ads. Back in 1981, when we were doing the original electronic games, we, we were looking at one page of advertising to one page of content. Right. I think in this final 150th issue uh, of Tips and Tricks, there are probably about eight, nine pages of it. Yeah, no more than that. Um, and, uh, That's right, Bill. Good <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, so really, again, the, the question is, you know, I mean, we've, we've now got this bifurcated system of journalism where there are online journalists and there are print journalists. And it can be real funny at press events, you know, when all of a sudden they stand up and say, you online people, get out of here. And the rest of you sign non disclosures and embargoes now, or you do not see anything. I mean, you know, I come from the day when, when a new system came out, they sent you four of them, and you distributed them among the staff. Now you get one week delivered at gunpoint, literally, Got the guy's arm. And when a new game comes out, he comes up there with the key, he unlocks the machine, puts the game in, closes it up, and locks it up again. Okay, that's how afraid they are of information about these games getting out in advance. I mean, it's, I believe it's gone beyond the point of even, you know, films. I don't think George Lucas protected his secrets better. Than, than the game industry has. And so it, it's become this weird world where, you know, you've got game sites, you know, not to name one, but like Taku, for example, they won't print anything. I mean, they'll pick something up off somebody's blog and they won't even call to confirm, you know, if 
to see if you know the person he's talking about you know has the same opinion. You know, they don't go to that level of journalism, but nonetheless, that instant journalism has kind of taken over the field. Mm -hmm. And at least, at least that's my thesis to explain my failure to revive the magazine. <laughs> right. I mean, that's something that we've had to deal with in Wired because obviously we you know, look towards um, blogs as being sort of the next big step in news. Um, and it's just trying to ride that very fine line between making sure the medium is not the message that we're using tool for, for fast reporting, and it does cast a wider net into things like, you know, guy makes a cake that looks like a weed, and I mean, well, that's a, you know, that's a news story, it wouldn't have gone on the front page, you wouldn't have signed an editor to it, you know, but uh, but we can blog about it in 15 minutes, you know, and then just sort of throw it out there and see what people respond to, but at the same time, it really does pose the, even if you start with the, with the assumption of, you know, we are going to be journalistically responsible, and we're going to make sure that, you know, what we, what we print is back, we go back to the source. Even if you're, you're totally dedicated to that idea, just the fact that you have to produce so much content in such a short span of time means that you're constantly struggling with it every day. I think it also gets harder to, you know, look at the big picture. You know, I mean, day by day, you're, you know, I mean, a magazine like Tips and Tricks making tons of money for 10 years, you know, just doing great. And all of a sudden, they start calling and telling you, you know, we just, we're dropping sales. You know, you're doing something wrong. You know, the assumption's got to be you're doing something wrong. Not that maybe things have evolved to the point where people would rather wade through 20 amateurishly written uh, walkthroughs on GameFacts.com than they would, you know, spending. How much was it? Five million dollars. That's very expensive. Yeah. Uh, but rather than spending the money to have the magazine in front of them and have pictures and guides to look through. So, you know, one of the things we were working on back when, when they showed us that was a website that, that would have brought a lot of that content uh, over to the web. And it was certainly considered up to the last minute that the magazine might eventually die and live on only in a web presence. Of, and we see this everywhere. Again, you see it with Ziff Davis. If you're seeing it with Ziff Davis, you know that this is an industry-wide play. The magazine says, I mean, I can't believe Play Magazine makes money. I, I would know. I mean, uh, their paper alone has got to cost more than they're making. It's, okay. it's a gorgeous magazine, yeah. Absolutely, but I, I, there's, there's no way that they're breaking. No way they're coming close to breaking. Either. If EGM can't break even, if, if, if Game Informer has to go to a paradigm of, you know, forcing them into people's uh, you right. know, push up while they're asleep. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it, 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 when Nintendo Power has to start drinking deals with outside people, but they have they ever said that? Yeah, yeah. they haven't announced who's going to be doing it. No, but they, yeah, Nintendo Power is licensing the magazine out to something. You know, this is, this is Nintendo with a magazine that inexplicably has the respect of readers. Right. You know, right. I'm just speaking on that. Who, who can give you a fairer, well, who is, if I ever lied, you'd be blur. If I ever see you're wrong, hey, this is a terrible Nintendo game. I'll see your review of Mario and the <laughs> You know, I mean, the power that that gave Nintendo. I mean, you'd think even as a break even, it would have had yeah. it been worth it to the right. But it shows you even that model. Even exactly. that model that magazine work and as advertising people does not, it's, yeah, they're reaching people in, in different ways and they don't need that old model of, of sending out a great magazine. Even that doesn't work. Well, really let's ask the audience. How many folks in this room subscribe to a game magazine? It's sort of a self-selected sample. <laughs> <laughs> and even so, it's not a, it's not right, a it's not close to a majority. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I, I think, you know, that, you know, you go back, and, you know, we were selling 300,000 copies of, of electronic games in 83, and uh, we had about seven or eight competitors out there, all of whom were also breaking even. Clearly, you know, people are no longer looking to magazines right. for, for, you know, uh, for their information. I mean, they can go, they can get it online for free, and, you know, much of, I'm, I'm from, you know, I like something I can take you to the bathroom with. Like, to be honest. But, uh, you know, today, they, they take their iPhone into the bathroom with them, and they can read it online. So, you know, it, I do wonder if, if you know, in, 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 in three years even, if, if there will be any significant uh, game magazine trend out there. And I must say the best idea I've heard up there the entire time I was up there, Lisa 
lady, our, our art director, brilliant art director, mm -hmm. gave it to me. She said, they should print this magazine in Spanish. And at that time, they weren't ready to listen to anything, mm -hmm. you know, I mean. But a Spanish language edition of this magazine, I believe, would have kept it in business. And I think somebody's going to smarten up and realize that that is an incredible market. I mean, uh, a Spanish language video game magazine will sell. I, you know, I don't have the money to put out the back of what I'm saying, but I, I honestly believe that. But you know, beyond that, you do have to wonder if the mainstream just simply no longer looks to magazines, no longer depends upon magazines. You know, Wired is in a slightly different position. Yes, so yeah, you're probably I mean, a much broader campus. Right, and I mean, you have an audience who is looking for higher quality stuff. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about magazine articles, you're talking about something that has gone through, I mean, literally, a news article that I write, at, at the most, we spend, like, it's a huge feature a week, you know, like, polishing it up. For the magazine, you're talking about, like, a three-month lead time, you have all these great people who have their hands in it, and it's a really, it's a much, much, much better story to read through. And then, uh, certainly you can do that with, with great video game magazines, but the question is, A, you have the talent, and you know you, you have guys who can, can, can do that. B, is the audience out there? You know, are there actually people out there who are willing to pay a premium for better written content about video games? And the answer is looking like no right now. Yeah, well, we spent, we would spend how many what percent of that time <coughs> looking at just the top piece of the cover? Yeah, we would spend probably two or three days just working on the cover itself. And, and, and the time, they were because, you know, they were convinced it was going behind the other magazines. Yeah. And that all anybody was seeing was this up here. So we probably spent five times as much time on the top quarter of the day. But that's the partially also day. because LFP is an old school magazine yeah. publisher. And, and you know, they know newsstand. Traditional magazine distribution. You know, don't know that much about how the content impacts the sales. Yeah, and which was another. Well, I mean, they were publishing what 24 magazines, say 10 years ago. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, 20 or 30. And what did they get to now? Five. Well, it's less than five. They only have one non-adult magazine. <laughs> yeah, a yeah, hot club, which is also good. I saw you. Joe told me a story yesterday that just broke my heart. When, when Joe Santulli opened his video game store in New Jersey. Uh, because of the fact that he used to do our collector's closet column, I thought, you know, we have to have a presence in that store. So every month, I would, our editorial assistant would put together a big stack of Tips and Tricks magazines and send them to him so that he could, you know, just make a few bucks off of them and display them prominently in the store. And I, I saw pictures of the place with Tips and Tricks on a rack when we first walked in the door. And I would ask him every once in a while, well, what is you sold? Well, I really want to get some feedback on that because this is a place where hardcore video games go. And uh, he never really said too much until yesterday. He said, you know, I, I actually discounted the magazine. He said he was only charging like two or three bucks for it, and they would just sit there. And I thought, you know, if, if people who go to that store don't even want to buy tips and tricks, then, then I'm not surprised. That that's You're right, Chris. Chris. <laughs> that's right, Bill. <no. laughs> That, and I don't want, you know, I, we're, we're kind of getting the down a little bit on tips and tricks, and I, 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 I certainly want to state from an outsider's perspective that it was really just a wonderful magazine. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was also uh, really what you guys did as far as like, reviewing fanzines back in the day. Uh, yeah, we did yours. Really helped me out. <laughs> Seriously, because they were, oh man, I don't know if it was you who wrote it or, or you know, somebody got this whole issue, or, you know, this issue of this fanzine that I had done when I was in high school and uh, called it like, you know, some of the best stuff we've read in any fan or professional magazine. And I mean, that just, you know, orders came in by the, by the, well, tens, but you know. <laughs> but it was people who I wanted to read it, you know, and it was people who would give me freelance work after that. So Dips and Tricks was, was, was great, and I'm really, really glad to see it go. Well, we tried to do the kind of things that, you know, first of all, we tried to do things that were not, you know, press releases and information that you'd see in any of the other magazines. Uh, but we also tried to, uh, I don't really know how to say this, but people think of tips and tricks as a source of information, and they think that that information can be had online for free. Therefore, the magazine is useless to me. But you know, we thought of it as a package with a function. And you know, for example, the strategy guides. You know, that's something that you'd want to have in print on the couch next to you when you're playing the game, instead of printing it out on your printer or you know, having to have your computer on while you're playing the game. Um, things like the pencil puzzles and, and uh, 
some of the what you meant, some of the you know lifestyle columns. You know, we were trying to do stuff that you can't get online, and that <coughs> there's a reason for it to be in print as opposed to online. I mean, we were covering things. I mean, we were really going to places that none of the other magazines were touching. Game schools, you know, careers in gaming, uh, uh, professional gaming. You know, areas that I, I wasn't seeing covered in any other magazine, and yet. It was it was just impossible to break through. It was like people weren't seeing the magazine on the news. Well, that's another part. Man. I mean, I'm I'm still naive enough to think that there's a market out there for a magazine like Tips and Tricks. Yeah. But the company that was publishing it didn't really believe in marketing. It. Their philosophy was you reach it on the newsstand and hope that people see it there. Right. And, and I, I kept yeah. telling them you need to be doing something to drive people to the newsstand to look for it. If that's all you're going to do is a print magazine, you know, you've got to tell people that it exists. And yeah, you make a big change then at the same time. And when you're doing something new, I mean, you have to have so much more marketing muscle behind it than just doing the same old thing. Yeah. Because people need to get that message. And so if the company is behind you, you know, 110% getting that out and, and staying with you guys for longer than like nine months, you know, with this with new concept, it, it, it was never going to happen. And what's really funny though is that, you know, when they Obviously, when they brought Bill in, it was kind of like the writing on the wall. I mean, I thought, obviously, <laughs> well, Jesus, you know, Dad, Dad. You know, if, they don't, if they don't trust me to do it myself anymore, it must not be doing well. But really, actually, at the end, they finally started to realize that it wasn't our fault that the magazine was. Yeah. So, I mean, they looked at they all the magazines and say, did this say, you know, we do magazine. It took them a number of years to get to that point. Yeah. But they finally realized, you know, we know you guys are doing everything you can with the resources we give you and the, and the talent that you have. But um, they, you know, they just weren't willing to spend the money to, to, to spread the word about it. And in fact, when the when the magazine was killed, the most common uh, comment I saw on the message boards was, "Are they still around?" I didn't yeah. know it still exists. Yeah. Or I go to Game Pack. Yeah. You know, the, you know, and our our idea was, you know, get it online. I mean. Who wants to wait through 25 amateurs written, unedited, untested game walkthroughs when you can get one that's beautiful with pictures and all that other stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like a natural thing, but you know, when you when you're working in a magazine company where basically one person can sit down and say that's it, mm -hmm. you know, when he loses faith. And he kept he kept faith but when you know I mean I went in as a consultant originally and he said I could be a million for it so they could um, yeah I don't know what happened it and I thought it would be nice to pass over to a publisher who would try to resurrect him and save it but no he didn't want to give it up and then it was like he gave it nine months and it hadn't turned around and that was it so what was one guy saying you know that's it tell him yeah. shut down the website shut down everything it's it's all gone. Should we take some questions? Yeah, maybe have any questions. Uh, like, you're the, the cameraman. Um, I was wondering if you would possibly factor into the you know, sort of client print magazine, uh, sort of the text message speak that comes from, especially in the English circles. I mean, you know, we might imitate it, you know, just for fun on an online forum or something. But you think the fact that, you know, there are studies saying that kids mastery of the English language being destroyed by, you know, three-letter abbreviations of five-syllable words. Does that factor into it all, you think? Well, in terms of communication, I think one of the advantages that you have in a magazine as opposed to a website, a website is you're going to get a quick blast of information. And, I mean, Wired magazine would give, you know, a 25-page interview with somebody if they've got somebody who can give you one, just like Playboy will. You know, if you've got somebody who's worth reading for that many pages, you know, and magazines are about going in depth. And you know, we're living in a world where disease isn't real until you can give it three initials. You know. Restless leg syndrome, I don't want to know what they I have RLS. Oh, oh I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you know, so we do. We live in a, in a I mean, have you seen the commercial where the kids talking to her mother and you know, about the, the amount of time she's spending on the phone and she's talking entirely in abbreviation. You know, this is another language that's evolving. Yeah. It's almost like, like a feeling like you don't speak the same language as the people you're communicating with. These, these kids are texting all day. I've never texted in my life. <laughs> it's not a good time to start, but actually, I know. <laughs> 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 
the idea of not even so much the language itself, but the idea that people are consuming media differently right now really does factor into it a lot. That people want to, you know, pick and choose and spend a couple of seconds on this website and a couple of seconds on this one and just jump back and forth and get information really, really quickly, have, you know, five windows open at once or whatever, to be browsing forward or thinking all kinds of different things. Um, the magazine doesn't give you that. There are no hyperlinks in a magazine. You know, you're, you're pretty much going from, from start to finish. Um, you cannot yet read the internet of the toilet. I mean, I guess you can, but uh, I think that that does, that, that is being a print saving grace. They just, uh, My iPhone. Call it. <coughs> My iPhone. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. one, one of the only things that we really could do to cover that was to have more pictures, less text. I and mean, that was kind of the philosophy that even the high-rise you know, were, were pushing on us later in the day. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, when you're giving out information, that can also make things up. Yeah, we, I mean, when, when we first started Tips and Tricks, our philosophy was to make it right. Those crazy Japanese magazines that come out once a week, and they're just so packed with microscopic information that you can't help but you know put down the money to buy it because it's so bursting with the seams with stuff. And uh, you know, when you do bigger pictures and less text, you get a nicer looking magazine. But you know you're getting less strategy guides, you're getting less information. And you know I agree with it because you know some of the things that we wanted to show were more important than what we wanted to say. And we knew that people don't like to read, so you know, we thought uh, with something like Collector's Closet, you know, I started to really shift over to something where I was just showing pictures of stuff and having little descriptions of them as opposed to just, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of text describing why this is interesting. But in terms of the language, I mean we had we had arguments just a month before the yeah. end about video. Is video games game. one word or two? Mm -hmm. yeah. How many say it's one word? How many say it's two words? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> video game style guide that, uh, that, that, that a couple of guys it, put out. They what say we, it's one word. That's why we, we decided not to use it. As a matter of fact, you know what the, the yellow document came from Andy Hay? People pointed out that if you do a Google search, I look it as one word, you get a really crappy bunch of listings. Whereas if you list it as two words, you get lots and lots and lots of things. Even you can, more relevant even from ones. the sites that right, even from the sites that listed as one word, you, they get in there too. So I was I was good enough. Well, next generation magazine always had as one word, but I think all the others. Well, we, in the in the, in the first magazine, electronic gaming would be it, and it's more. Yeah. And uh, I had always written it that way my entire life. Well, <coughs> Tips and Tricks started out as video games and computer entertainment, and then became a magazine called Video Games One Word. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it, but in both of those magazines, video games was always written as two words. Yeah, it was in the magazine yeah. itself. Yeah. Uh, more questions? I got one. Uh, thanks for being the, the new editor in chief, uh, Bill, and, and Tips and Tricks magazine. Uh, in the last issue of Tips and Tricks magazine, where did the collector's closet go to? Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, people yeah. accuse me of like whacking it in the last issue. You, know? you know what? I'll tell you what happened. We, uh, uh, Charlotte, our, our senior editor, our executive editor, she had gone to Japan and done all these interviews with Japanese developers and stuff. She had a lot of content she wanted to get into that August issue. My son was graduating from high school, so I took a week's vacation during that issue. Um, our art director had a death in the family, so while she was out, I was writing. I was doing layouts instead of writing my columns. And I thought, you know, it won't really be a big deal if I don't do collector's closet this month because I'll just do it next month. Because I didn't know it was going to be the last issue. Who knows? You know. So it was just an unfortunate, it wasn't an intentional uh, omission. It was just a sequence of events that and got it left out. The know. idea that the 150th issue was the last issue was yeah, it's a nice a round number. chance, you know. I mean, it, yeah. Uh, though one of our more foolhardy uh, freelancers blogged that uh, there was this secret conspiracy going on, by the way, because any of you read about this and the cock who picked it up, which is one of the reasons I'm so currently in love with it. And he basically says, you know, oh, this is all a conspiracy, they were going to fire the entire staff while they were at E3. <laughs> and well, in the first place, it's my understanding that if you own the magazine, you can fire people anytime you want. You don't believe it's a conspiracy, <laughs> uh, but uh, 
I had actually suggested that if you're shutting it down any day now, please do it before E3 rather than after E3, because at least this way the staff gets a chance to go in and maybe get another job. And they can, they can go in networking, not thinking they're collecting information for a magazine that's dead. So, you know, but again, this, this got picked up. But it just, it, yeah, it just happened to end on the 150th issue. None of it was planned, but uh, I guess it somehow... Well, somebody planned it. Well, yeah, th though it, it happened so quickly. I mean, I don't think they ever really considered yeah. it was going to be the 150th issue or, you well, know. I remember telling you, you know, this is our 150th issue, so you should say something in the end total about yeah. it. Yeah. And then you didn't. Well, <laughs> and I thought... It was about how great our website was. Oh, <laughs> right! The website they immediately took down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a, anyway, well, I wish we could have had like a farewell message in there or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we had this, you know, this was already in printers, you know, when they decided this was happening. So. Oh, I had, I had to tell them something that probably nobody knows. Before they decided to kill the magazine, they actually, uh, they wanted to changed to a bi-monthly format where yes. August was going to be the last monthly issue and we knew this several months ago. Uh, September was going to be one of the code book special issues. Uh, October would be tips and tricks. November would be a code book. So we were all preparing for that change. Yes. you know. And it, I thought it would actually be easier and healthier because the code books always sell. The code books for some reason, I, now, I don't know if anyone can explain this. Yeah, I that, that the code books made money. These, you know, entire magazines filled with the cheat codes, you know, they'll alter the source <coughs> code. Yeah, and well, you know, he's a master. The fact that the fact that those code. made more money yeah. than the monthly magazine, which we put ten times the effort oh, into right. Right. Yeah. So they finally said, you know, this is this is a <coughs> This is a better business yeah, model. Right. You know, we'll, make, right. we'll make more money on the code books. And the code books are more expensive on the newsstand, too. Yeah. Which I, is the real unbelievable it's thing. It's totally inexplicable to me. I, mean, I wasn't able to understand it as a consultant. I wasn't able to understand it as the editor of TV. And I'm still going to be doing the code books bi monthly yes. as a freelancer. So if you're interested in that. Well, so. I think Mark, go for that. Oh. Yo, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I like about tips and tricks is that, like the collector's closet, the little coins in their case, the eBay options they need, the other stuff that wasn't tips and tricks. It's not play game I just play, I don't look anything up usually. But I, I like all that stuff, and uh, like Chris, the arcade articles and all that. that that's the stuff I like to make work. I wonder if the audience for that type of material is so different from the audience that looks for tips and tricks that maybe. The reason the code book sold is because that's what it was in the magazine. You know, maybe someone looking for the content that I'm talking about didn't commit to it because they didn't care about the tips and tricks. Now, I think I think there was there was some sense of resistance by the younger readers who felt they weren't, you know, they felt they weren't getting enough of the strategy guides and the cheat codes, and whereas the older readers weren't giving us a chance because they still considered. I mean, we. It, the January issue this year was the first issue that we had an email address in. So, you know, our letters tended to come from young kids written handwritten on, you know, blue notebook paper. And comics. Do you think there's a market, big enough market for a magazine that's just all the content like I mentioned? That's just the lifestyle just content? Reviews, lifestyle content, just fun stuff like that. Retro and current, just sort of a general video game magazine. I'd like to think so. I mean, there's really not one. You know, I mean, retro, just, Europe has uh, retro gamer. Mm -hmm. There was an American version. Of that. Well, it's so much easier to, to get magazines on the shelves in Europe yeah, because yeah. I mean, you're talking about smaller countries, and uh, you know, it's easier to distribute them. You can do them even like weekly, bi-weekly if you if you really want to. Um, just because they're you can print up fewer copies and get them on fewer newsstands. When you're doing an American magazine, you're sending them all out over the country. It's a huge, huge undertaking. And there was a lot of discussion about changing the title of the magazine, but we didn't. Again, we didn't want to give that up. We didn't want to give up the readership that we had, you know. So it was it was this tightrope walk to you know include enough lifestyle material in there that you could be satisfied reading that, and yet you still wouldn't feel like you know I I just want the cheat codes, you know. I I just want the strategy guides, and you know they're filling up the pages with stuff on game schools, you know. So yeah. I, you know, 
obviously it didn't work. So it is perhaps possible that those two audiences were not uh, sympathetic. Well, I personally think that when you're talking about video game magazines, you're talking about somebody who has to be passionate enough about video games to want to buy a magazine and read about them, as opposed to taking that five or six bucks to put it for the purchase of a new game. And I frankly, you know, kids are much more enthusiastic about video games than adults are because adults have cars and <coughs> girlfriends and, and boyfriends and, and you know responsibility, and, and uh, they just don't have that same level of excitement, or they just can't wait to read the new issue of whatever magazine. You know? do, but do you guys think that I mean we don't have a Rolling Stone magazine in our industry or anything near equivalent to that? Uh, maybe in the Edge in Europe has some kind of label like that. But we don't do very much in our industry to promote the people who make games. We, we don't go out and try to, except for events like CGE and other conventions, there's there's not a forum or a platform for them to become famous, so to speak. I mean, there's Pussy B or you know, Tommy Puerto Rico who invented themselves. But we don't we don't really feature those guys in any of our, our magazines, or, or it, it, it's rare. So, do you think there's a place for that, or how, how is that going to evolve? Because the movie and music industries have, have a lot of these kinds of magazines. We don't have that, and I think, uh, you know, I'm in my 30s, you guys in your 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, and we're still playing games, and our industry is getting older, and I'm not as interested in reading these as I was when I was, you know, 15. So, and the content that's online is great, but I'm still looking for that same thing in this guy over here. Well, one of the problems <coughs> obviously with this industry is it doesn't have stars. I mean, every other form of the entertainment industry has stars. I mean, when was the last time you saw a game that had on the box by the creators of and listed another game? I mean, the fact is this is a very paranoid industry. It's been paranoid right. since 1978 when right. I got into right. it. I mean, you, you could go to E3s and CESs and if you were from another company, you wouldn't be allowed into like the EA booth or wherever, you know. And it, the the names, of, I mean, it, it's ironic that the two companies that made their bones by putting the names of the creators out there, uh, Activision and Electronic Arts, are of course today the two companies that do the most magnificent job of keeping their talent hidden. Right. Now, um, uh, it, it, so, uh, and I, I, I think the answer to these questions about, you know, um, whether or not there's a market for this or there's ever going to be a market for this is, yeah, eventually. I mean, the, the, the industry is still just so <coughs> immature in that, in that sense that we haven't really gotten out of this. I, I, and I, I like the, the term paranoia. I mean, that, that is really it. Um, people are realizing, I mean, okay. Nintendo, starting in like 1996, 1997, Mario 64 came out, embarked on this like essentially PR mission. You know, we are going to make Shigeru Miyamoto, like, he, we're going to make him into Shigeru Miyamoto, the world's most famous video game designer. You know, and really, really, really hype this guy up, which before that time, they had not done. Certain people knew who he was, but he could go on the E3 show floor and walk around because they weren't using him in that way. And other video game companies are finally starting to come around with a sense of, we can do that. We can actually take our people and we can make them into stars like that. And you start to see people doing that. The problem is, and I'll, I'll illustrate this with a, a specific <coughs> thing that was happening. Um, 2K was taking around the, the director of uh, Bioshock, who done the, the, the System Shock games, right? And so they kind of pitched this to, um, to, to people and said, okay, hey, you know, we, we've got this guy. He's, he's famous, you know, as, as being the developer of these, these, these games in the past, and now he's doing this brand new game just for us. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're you know, taking him around the press tour, and, and that all sounded really great until um, they eventually then said once they, they brought him by, because um, Zip was going to do, we're going to do a Retronauts, you know, based on the older games. They were like, oh, well, uh, you can't discuss any games that were, were produced for different publishers. Yeah, you can only discuss games that were done for, for our publisher, which yeah. is that one. The game publishers very desperately want to control the flow of information out of their companies. Right. And they discouraged us from talking directly to the developers because they knew mm -hmm. that we would send them a box of hustle magazines and say, hey, send us the check Right. <laughs> but but can you, I mean, can you imagine like anybody like taking, if you, if you were a new record label and you just signed, you know, uh, whatever, you just signed the killers or whatever, and you come around and you said, oh, we can't talk about the game. <laughs> 
pretend that it didn't happen. You, know, you can only talk about this one product. It doesn't make any sense to not have an artist to have an artist not be able to discuss prior art. Yeah. But they just don't they don't get that yet. They don't realize it. No, they don't. They, and uh, and again, because they haven't broken through that wall of if they know who it is, you know. And so yeah. what they, they they're willing to advertise the team. You know, kind of like a band, right, but right, they right. just don't want you to know who plays bass and who mm -hmm. plays lead guitar and, and what the name of that lead singer is who's really standing out. Yeah, that could backfire on them too. Yeah, they have a company like Rare, where all of the important people <coughs> have basically left over the years. Yeah, yeah. you know, they still so want Rare. They're still the drifters. Thing. You know, they're all dead, but the drifters are still playing. Right. Right. here in Las Vegas. Yeah. Where you look at people like, uh, I mean, how long does it take big name video? And, and you know, it does. It is the video game industry is kind of practice back to bite you in the ass of how you treat your employees because how long does it take video game designers these days from the minute that they get name recognition for a huge project to like the day that they quit and start their own development studio. Seeing so much of that in Japan. Japanese game developers are just saying like, you know what, we're not going to take this like low ass salaries anymore, we're just going to quit and start our own company um, and work fewer hours for way more money and much more recognition. And uh, David Jackie just uh, you know, left Sony, he still doing games, for, for Sony, but he left and he quit and he started his own studio. <coughs> within, within how many years after God of War came out? 2003? 2004? After GoldenEye and Perfect Dark came out, there were guys who would shot like 10 minutes of video and they were I'm part of the Perfect Dark team. You know, and they were starting oh, right, their own yeah. companies. And you know, they, when you get their press kit, that would be their big, you know, I was, you know, uh, assistant, uh, you know, for, you know, by well the microphone, you know, while they were yeah. doing the uh, cut. <coughs> yeah. And because you, the per name Perfect Dark was associated with it. I mean, it, it seems to me, you know, if you want to be marketed, if you want to be known in this industry, you've got to do what Cliffy B and Tommy Del Rico and those people have done. Mm -hmm. You have got to go out there and market yourself. You have got to introduce yourself to the press, yeah. and find the press, and make sure they cover you. I just, I got a chance yeah. to do a, an interview with the man who designed Space Invaders, okay, uh, the Dr. C design. And uh, he doesn't speak English, so we had Brooklyn, we had Anatole Brown on our staff, who was born in Japan and speaks fluent Japanese. And, you know, the, the ability to talk to this man, whose name I hadn't even known, probably one right. of the most right. influential men in my life, mm -hmm. you know, Space Invaders was the game that appeared on the first cover of Electronic Game. <laughs> You know, he was finally a chance, you know, 30 years later to actually talk to him. Yeah. It, was, it was quite amazing. But, uh, it did, and again, you have that whole thing where somebody's a game with Japanese and somebody goes to develop and somebody speak English. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine if half of the rock and roll that you listen to were produced by a band from, you know, uh, Russia, you know, and none of them spoke English. It'd be very hard to come up with. <laughs> You if you wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you do see people, I mean, really trying to, um, to get their, their stars out there, but they, they do it in yeah. kind of hand-handed ways. Yeah, oh, sorry, any more questions? Uh, this phenomenon you were talking earlier about how people are going more into the electronic format, do you think it's limited to gaming magazines, or do you think it's going to no. spread to all magazines? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is with print gaming magazines, they're just Plus, we're doing that much better. You know, I mean, they, uh, I gather they held a, uh, uh, a, a, a focus group. They're going to open up a Hustler Casino Hotel out here in Las Vegas. I don't know if you're supposed to know that or not, but they're going to have some. I didn't know that. Uh, but, <laughs> they had always been you know, on the Golden Demo. There were a couple between the ages of like 24 and 34. And I said, how many of you think you are excited by the idea of a hotel casino called the Hustler or hotel casino in Las Vegas? And everybody's going to show up. Everybody knows. Fantastic idea. About four questions down. By the way, how many of you folks read Hustler? Not a hand goes up in the entire room. And this is like, you know, this is not like five people. This is like 50 people. And not a hand goes up. So, you know, and, and I mean, I never thought I'd reach the point in my life where I have to send something in an email saying, stop sending me porn. I have enough. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go out and buy a magazine at this point? Right, no. right, right. But I, I think you will see it's, it's probably more of a problem for the gaming magazines earlier than it is for other industries because obviously these are tech savvy people. Certainly, a PC games magazine. All of their readers own PCs. 
they have the ability yeah. to get that information online right by the fall. Of course, they put land cafes and presenter in there. You know, if they're their best words, they are online. I mean, you know, if you did sneak in with your mom and dad, I mean, you know, I mean, God, everything they're making these days. So it's up to the Yeah, all, you know, but all print is, is hurt. Right. Newspapers are hurt. Oh, absolutely. I and mean, the magazine cracks, you see it. So where do you think like a reader on itself who, who likes quality writing, I mean, you're obviously not getting it online in, in New York, you just got all these new people writing. When these print magazines go away, where will we like to go for quality writing? I think that you'll get it online because the increased competition there is going to make people realize that they can't just you know, hire an army of high school or a teacher and have a writing for a $5,000 a year. Um, so it will, it, it will always be out there. I mean, then you really worry, uh, I mean, how, how much real quality, you know, writing has uh, video game journalism turned out in the past, you know, four days? Not a lot. No. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's, so, there's not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the press company accepted them. Yeah. There's not a lot of good people out there who have the, you know, mastery of the English language. Right. Knowledge of the history of the industry and the game jobs. Ability to play the game. Yeah, and nobody wants to pay for it. No. I mean, you, there's there's people out there who get pretty good games, but they're they're in a, a tiny minority. Well, I think the industry, to a certain extent, especially at the print end, where they are financially burdened so badly, are kind of in the same position where the comic books were at in the late '70s when I when I was working with comics. Uh, a company called Charlton was like the number four company in the three company market, uh, <laughs> decided, you know, hey, these kids come in every day and they're willing to do this work for nothing. Why are we paying these people? And we've got a similar industry where we've got kids out there who will go in and be beta testers and do all this stuff for nothing. Because, you know, we've got kids who will do it for free. But of course what happened was the comic book sales, as bad as they were, dropped due to nothing because they were kids coming off the street. And there will always be a difference between the kids coming in off the street who love to play games. I mean, who, I, I was at a meet and greet uh, for a Tommy Tallarico's uh, video games live concert uh, at the Hollywood Bowl last year. And, you know, there were, these kids would keep coming up and saying, you know, I want to be a game journalist. What should I do? And I said, study journalism. You know, you've got a thousand people online here with you who all know games love games. That is not enough. Uh, we have the very few game journalists who are actually have training in journalism, who went to the University of Missouri or who went to, you know, to some top-notch journalism school. So as a result, this is, you know, this is a, <laughs> is a field that was invented by people who really didn't know what the hell they were doing. Right. So, uh, you know, journalism has never been a big factor. And it's always been so easy to get kids in and have them sit down and tell them you're going to play games all day, and then you're going to write a paragraph about it. And you and your five friends are each going to write what you think about this game and have playing it for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's what you get. You get, you get what you pay for, you get crap. Right. But then, I mean, then again, you know, from, I was writing articles about video games, you know, for, for myself and, you know, again, those, those, those dozen people, essentially, since I was like 13, 14, and when you have that spare time and that passion and that, like, extra six hours a day that you don't know what to do with, you know, that's the time to, to, to funnel all that into, into this. And then by the time, you know, that you are actually going to be looking for a job, well, you've already got, you know, six, seven years of, of, of experience in, in working for peanuts, but yeah. when you have the time and the energy, that's the time to, the time, that's the time to do it. And I would tell those kids, if they're coming up asking you, you'd be like, start writing about video games. Yeah, I, and I think that, you know, uh, again, I, I don't know if game, if game magazines will die. I find it hard to believe that there won't be a game magazine out there, or, or a couple of game magazines out there for at least another 10 years. I, I maybe, uh, oh, we have, I don't think there's going to be a lot of them, and I think they're going to have to be very good. I think they're going to have to be written, you know, at the level of wire, mm -hmm. but, you know, just talking games, and then, and be sophisticated. I mean, and yet, you know, next generation came pretty close to giving us that magazine, and it right. did not succeed. Right. So, and that was at a point when people were still buying magazines. So, you know, the, the the ability to hold something in your hand is still a virtue. You know, I mean, we live in so much of our lives that live in a virtual world that it is nice every once in a while to pick something up in your hand and be able to look through it and uh, not have to scroll. Uh, so. 
and you know, again, we're, we're brought up, if we're brought up reading magazines, I think they'll, there's something that will keep, but clearly, you know, it's technology that is moving into the past. Right. I mean, there's always been a certain weight, a certain, you know, uh, gravity, essentially, print magazines, right? I mean, because they, they are that much more permanent, and the, the stuff in them seems, or seemed, I guess, to, to mean more. But then you're, but I mean, it's, it's getting to the point now where it's no longer really, it's, that's, that's no longer the case, and people are just so used to the online media and just getting their information in different ways that no longer has that that goal. Yes, it, it, what are you looking for? You know, are, are you looking for thoughtful analysis of the games, or are you just looking to see, you know, how the graphics are? Yeah, and if you're looking for, yeah, well, the joke at uh, Electronic Gaming Monthly is that they should just read any magazine to uh, scores and screenshots <laughs> based on what the majority of their readers are, are looking for. And, yeah, the and the reviews are sucks rules. Okay? This game sucks, this game rules. Okay, that's it. We're one or the other, and then that, that's yeah. what we want to know. Yeah. And if, if, if people do get to that point, right. the magazines will go away. Yeah. But that's what it's like now. And I really do think that in the future, yes, you know, often are going to hold it up, and that, you know, at some point there will be a market for this kind of stuff because you know, kind of keeps you going with thought that, you know, it, you know eventually <laughs> yeah. it must be able to. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we did. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yes. I'm sure they do great. They did better I can you know, a couple of years ago. I uh, have very, very good. Yeah, I think that I, I worked for Freeman in the mid '90s. Okay, when they were coining money, and the reason they were coining money was because the game publishers had no idea that this information had any value, so they were virtually giving it away. And I mean, they were maybe making like the five percent royalty, and they considered that it was totally crazy. Okay, and then all of a sudden, these books started selling, and they got a look at how much Freeman was taking in, and all of a sudden that percentage started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if it was a licensed book, I know we did Maximum Carnage uh, on the uh, Super Nintendo <coughs> uh, Spider-Man game. And that game was like, uh, I think they went like 15% by the time they get to deal with Marvel and dealing with the claim. And even then, the developers wouldn't tell us anything. Because like, what are we getting out of it? So the developers were not making any money at all off this, so they were getting no cooperation. I mean, you know, the claim could say, give them the information. And what they did was they sent us a speeded up version of the game. So we'd say, you know, all these certain things are really difficult, you're going to have to, and then of course we get the game and it's half speed. And it looks like the easiest thing in the world, you just jumped over it, you know. So they, they really started uh, feeling resentful for these companies, and now, you know, you, you see a lot more unofficial guides than you used to. You know, they were really oh yeah, I, I the unofficial. Why pay the money for the license? You know, I mean, we, we you know, I mean, when we were doing the Final Fantasy book, they just buy right. the Japanese book and have somebody translate it for us. Right. You know, I was under the impression that they, it, the the ship was the opposite way that they weren't really doing a lot of unofficial uh, guidebooks anymore. You know, it's, it's not a section of the bookstore that I really tend to go in here, but. Uh, I know the last ones I did for Brady were all, you know, the, the, uh, actually I did one for a claim, I'm just going to start the own division, and it was uh, Raw, who was oh, a okay. wrestling game. Uh, that, that was, I think, the last one I did. But I did like, like three books for Brady, which they then republished as pieces of like other collections. Oh, okay. So I think they published a lot of the stuff three and four times right. to, in order to amortize it and get their money back. But I can't believe that 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 people are spent that those companies are doing nearly as well as they were doing ten years ago. I don't think they're making fifty percent of what they were making. Again, they're competing. They have the same problem we did. Yeah. You know, why don't I just go up to game facts or why don't I just go up to you know one of the game sites and get this information? Yeah, they definitely start to do more. Yeah, the, the DVD mentality. 
uh, you know, the making of the game. You know, the the design sketches and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we would try to tell you everything you need to know within six pages. But you know, they have the luxury of having paid for the license. You know, they have the support of the publisher and all the official stuff. They would do posters, soundtrack discs. I think that's a good that's a good way to go because it, it's more enticing. You know, when you're buying the game, there are people who buy the game and strategy back at the same time, and there are stores that package them together. You know, for a certain price. And, and you know, we always saw them as competition because, of course, we weren't paying anybody for the right to see the game before it was, it was published. Um, so you know, we had to rely on our guys' ability to lead the game to. I honestly believe that you know, those books are going to disappear and be replaced by DVD because it's so much easier to show you how to play the game than it is to tell you. I mean, there's nothing more than cool than, you know, go up to the upper left hand corner of the screen, now scroll up two and three quarter screens and move four inches to the right if you have a 20 inch television. <laughs> And from that spot, if you press ZZBB, left, right, up, down, you know, you, you, it's just so awkward. Whereas if you can do it in a, in a video, on a, on a DVD, you know, you can get the, the testers are playing it anyway. It's being, you can be recorded just as easily. Why not let them see what you're doing? Just, you know, freeze frame if you need to and say, okay, well, here are the controls you just press. You know, to, to me, that's, uh, I, I, 10 years I was telling them, what do you do, at least not including a DVD? in with these books because mm -hmm. I don't think people want to read 300 pages. I mean, that, again, I think that's from reading. Right. I mean, I feel like it's a timing issue because they're not going to show on a DVD anything that's not a finished game. Yeah. And um, I don't think really, I mean, you know, considering the amount of effort that would have to go into something like that, uh, you'd be using an earlier, earlier version of the game. Well, you right. the books they're using, you know. I think the companies themselves would be it. Right. But sense. even then, I mean, they might not even have access. They don't, the game's not even I'm done yet. Yeah. You know, they can't yet. Yeah. On that kind of weird note. Um, is there any more questions? Is there or not? You can all leave then. Yeah. Or stick around and talk. Yeah, you can hang The uh, CGE panel is going to start. Uh, <coughs> I think that's what I'm Yeah. And copies of Bill's book, which is really, really great. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, I, there are stories in there. <laughs> of course, it's good.